going to take two sessions today. Both the sessions, uh, session will be on uh, and the Uh, I think uh, the professor, our coordinator, Professor Bartindu, must be having a weak link. So I wish all the participants and, of course, my senior in the department, Professor Bartendu Singh, a very good afternoon today. And I am, let me say, very honored to be a part of this HRDC faculty induction program yet again. So as already introduced by Professor Bartendu, I will be giving two lectures this evening. I will be discussing two topics which are very, very relevant if we are want, if we want to be in the world of teaching. However, uh, before I say that, I would I, before I start, I would like to know whether I'm audible or not. If I am audible, can you just uh, type in yes in the chat box so that thank you very much. Yes, it's clear. So that means we can start. I will simply open my slideshow. And if in between you have any problem, always feel free to come to me. So as I said earlier, there are two topics I will be discussing this evening with you. I will be first of all talking about teaching strategies, which will be a little bit teacher centered the lecture will be centered on me uh, mostly, but in the second part of the lecture, which will be on micro teaching, I will be expecting you all to participate as much as possible. And I will take you through the stages of micro teaching so that all of you will go back to your institutions with hopefully something that will implement something that will be a supplementary support to your teaching whichever discipline you are teaching so on that note i will begin my lecture on teaching strategies as I have said earlier, when we talk about teaching strategies, we are basically talking about uh, how, what sort of plan we have. So what exactly is teaching? What exactly is strategy? So let us try to study all of these from the very beginning. So when we talk about strategy, we are, excuse me, uh, this is an important call. So uh, when we talk about a strategy, we are talking about a plan, an action, or to be more uh, complex, sometimes we call it a plan of action, isn't it? So we are mainly interested in how the ends will be achieved by the means. And here, when we talk about ends here, the goals here in teaching, we are talking about whatever lesson we are trying to impart, what kind of knowledge we want the students to know, and what kind of resources, what kind of strategies, by resource we mean the useful things, the things that can be useful to uh, implement whatever plan we have ahead. So how the goal ends will be achieved by the means, what kind of means will we be using, all of these come under strategy. And of course, as you all know, teaching is nothing but um, a simple way to um, 
before that a little bit about teaching. So teaching is a specialized application of knowledge, skills, and attributes designed to, pro designed to provide unique service to meet the educational needs of the individual and of the society. As we all know, anybody can teach, but whether that teaching is, you can all teach me anything that you want. I can all teach you that anything that I want, but will you understand? Will I understand what you teach me? You might be thinking you're teaching me something very, very important, but will I be able to understand? I might be thinking right now I'm teaching them teaching strategies so they will know what teaching strategy is. So that means their teaching abilities will be improved, but will that happen? So unless and until we understand what we really want, the goals that we really want to achieve and the feedback that we can receive from our students, it is very, very important. It is, it is very, very difficult to truly understand the importance, the impact that a good teaching strategy can have on our students. And otherwise also, I can simply do you know, a lesson in one whole hour, be done with it. And so long as I'm done with it, I am done on my part, never mind what the students feel. So regardless of what the students feel, regardless of what the students have been able to grasp and understand, so long as the teacher, the instructor feels he or she has done her part, then it's okay. So that sort of teaching can also take place. But what we need to understand is that if the teacher, the instructor only teaches to fit his own ends, the term is going to end on 30th of November. By that time, I should complete this. If he is only interested in that part, then it's a very, very sad case for the students because they may not be able to understand anything much, which is one of the saddest part of teaching in many institutions as, as have been proved by uh, research. So uh, in uh, wherever we have come from today, we want the kind of teaching experience that will enable us not only to not only to uh, you know become able teachers but also to become effective teachers isn't it anyone is able even a class one boy can be an effective teacher when it comes to the things that he has accomplished so anybody can become a teacher the important thing is to be effective isn't it and so here the end point is to be effective to be effective in what we do so the teaching strategy is explained as Thus, teaching strategies refer to the methods, techniques, procedures, and processes that a teacher uses during instruction. During instruction, isn't it? It generally, uh, it is generally recognized that teaching strategies are, they are multidimensional. They are not just one-sided. There are many, many dimensions of teaching with which we will become more and more acquainted with as we delve deeper and deeper into teaching whatever our disciplines may be. And their effectiveness depends on the context in which they are applied. For supposing today we have learned a number of teaching strategies, all of these strategies are useful in their own right. But the important thing is, what we need to understand is that not all students may be able to appreciate or you know value a certain teaching strategy based on his or her educational level based on his age based on uh, the kind of teaching he has received thus far and all of that uh, they will combine and or, or, and the teacher should be able to pick out, filter from the various teaching strategies, what sort of strategy will work in a certain situation, in a certain class, among a certain group of people. For example, if I am going to teach environmental education, when I'm standing in front of mass communication students, when I'm standing in front of my you know, local adults who need education in that area, and when I'm standing in front of my own students, uh, that is B Ed, M Ed, and M A education students, my teaching strategies also take different, you know, forms so that 
I try to make sure as much as possible that they will, they will, uh, the students, the audience will be able to grasp the maximum impact of what has been taught. If it is on the fundamentals of environmental education, yes, I have to teach in such a way that a local lady who has not crossed a class seven will be able to understand what kind of impact will her usage of water have on the environment? Her usage of water, her, not just water, but maybe soap, toothpaste, detergent, what, what sort of impacts will these have? on the environment. So I have to think of her everyday activities in order to make her understand and appreciate the importance of environmental conservation. Likewise, when I go to different students at different levels, I also have to know my students. I also have to understand the audience I am speaking to, their past experiences, their present experiences, so that I will make my teaching as impactful as possible. So that, therein lies the importance of teaching strategy. As I said earlier, this part of the lecture is going to be largely um, uh, it's going to be largely uh, centered on me, which I dislike as a, you know, as a rule, but it cannot be helped because right now we are very much dependent on this emergency digital education about which I will want to speak a little bit more later on also. So why is teaching strategy important? Teaching strategies play an important role in classroom instruction. Without the use of a strategy, teachers would be aimlessly projecting information that doesn't connect with learners. Remember I said that with learners or engage them. Strategies help learners participate, connect and add excitement to the content being delivered. I remember one time uh, uh, giving a small, I will talk about environmental education again. I, I remember one time giving an introduction to environmental education and the students were largely disinterested. They were MA education students at that time. It must have been around, around uh, 10 or 12, 13 years ago, quite a long time ago when I was uh, still quite uh, relatively young in the university. So I remember telling them, them at large about the environment, about the various you know, uh, chemical reactions that are always taking part in environment, maybe largely because I have a science background. So I'm quite interested in the you know, uh, uh, chemical reactions that are always taking part in the environment to, to make the environment the way it is today. However, I found out that the students were not very, very interested in what I was telling them about. I had prepared myself, myself for endless nights so that I would be able to interest my students, yet they were not very interested. But then I had added something which uh, I felt was not even, you know, very, very special. I had added the picture of broken ice, you know, the picture of broken ice on which on one of the larger chunks, there was a polar bear stuck in one of the larger chunks. So very soon the plight of the polar bear was very clear from the picture that was shown. So when, they, when the students saw the picture, when they saw the picture, they began to have their ooze and us and poor thing. So from then on, they began to have their own interest you know, a simple thing. I mean, it's not very simple. It really was serious. But in the context of what I was trying to explain, it it, you know, it was a seemingly less important than many of the, you know, uh, uh, environmental, uh, the, 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 the interactions that always take part between the living and the non-living in order to make the environment as dynamic as possible. So all of those concepts I was explaining, but they did not get through to the students. What got through to the student was the picture, the real picture taken by a zoologist of a bear, a polar bear stuck in a broken ice when the ice was melting. So, you know, depend uh, unknowingly, I had fortunately collected uh, uh, several pictures uh, out of which one made 
a really good impact. And fortunately, two of my students, when they joined their PhD courses, they chose environmental ed uh, education. And fortunately, two of them have completed their PhDs in environmental education. And one has even completed her, you know, scale on environmental activities. And we have sold that scale to Agra Psychological Corporation, which was a huge step for the both of us, both scholar and supervisor. So a little thing can go a long way. I had uh, spent hours and hours explaining about environmental education, but it was that simple picture which caught the mind and the sentiment of the students. That is why a good strategy can do a lot of things that hundreds and hundreds of lectures may not be able to accomplish. So it is important to have a good teaching strategy. I took that example of my class 12 or 13 years ago, uh, not to say that I am one of the best strategies to when it comes to teaching, but to just give an example. I said it was incidental, accidental that I had added that picture, but in my mind, what was more important uh, for me uh, in my teaching about environmental education was, you know, those explanation of the environment and, you know, those interactions that were taking place between the living and the non-living and the extinction that was forever taking place. However, uh, enough about that example. Let me go forward. So what kinds of teaching strategies do we have? As I said earlier, I warned you, this part of the lecture is going to be, I said, teacher-centered. Why is it teacher-centered? Because we are forced in a situation when I cannot see your faces and the only thing you can do is listen to what is being said. Because even your interactions, in that the kind of interactions, the feedback that you want, that you might want to share with me, they are now uh, repressed, repressed in the sense that your voices have been muted and your ability to show your videos have also been disabled. So the only thing you can do to show that you are actively interacting with me is use the chat box, isn't it? So uh, unlike the unlike the offline classes where we can, you know, busily actively interact with each other for the purpose of accomplishing the uh, teaching objectives for the coming three hours, I will have to make the present as teacher-centered as possible for the benefit of all of us. So, in the teacher-centered plan, the teacher plans what is to be taught, and the students learn whatever has been planned by the teacher, regardless of their opinions or their readiness to learn. Uh, in many cases, this is also called behavioral by psychologists, behavioral learning. So uh, they simply look at the outward behavior of the students. The students are sitting inside the class, which means they are ready to learn. I, the teacher, am in this class, which means I'm ready to teach. The classroom is empty except for the students and me. So therefore, there is the right environment for teaching. So let me go and teach. So in that way, uh, the teaching becomes very, very teacher-centered because the teacher starts at whatever points are convenient to her, and she hardly makes a note of what the students have learned so far, how much the students are being able to grasp at a certain point, or how much uh, the the students are really willing to listen to. So in many cases, the you know, class teachings go on and on and on. And then the students are hardly aware of what is going on. And ultimately, in a daze, you know, in a daze, the uh, semester is gone. The year is gone. So in that way, the teacher can be active, but without any real connection to the students, she can simply continue with what he or she, whatever the case may be, she or he can simply continue with what is to be taught, with what is outlined in the syllabus, accomplish her work and be done with it. So uh, uh, what will happen to the students, the major targets? They simply lose interest in whatever is being taught. 
And that is so sad. They have to, many parents, if they can afford it, they have to rely on extra tuitions. They have to rely on extra classes. They have to rely on so many things besides the classroom teaching. So in that way, uh, we are also, you know, many parents have also lost their faith in teachers. And we teachers like to stress again and again, teaching is not a job, it's a profession. So when we talk about teaching as a profession, we also need to remember that profession is something much more deep than mere job. A job is just part of a profession. If my profession is to teach, my afternoon's job is to talk about the kinds of teaching strategy. This job is a part of my profession. The profession is something bigger. So it needs a special training too. So therefore, when the teacher is simply concentrating on what is being learned based on what she or he has been able to complete within a certain stipulated time, the whole purpose of teaching is lost. So that is why, uh, you know, educational psychologists, uh, teachers, academicians, they have come with many new strategies of teaching. Today, you have access to so many things without having to go to the library also. You have access to Google, which will take you to so many sites, isn't it? So even when it comes to teaching strategies, we have more than 19, 20, 30, more than 40 teaching strategies altogether, if we are going to include the teacher-centered approach. So today I am going to take you through some of the basic strategies, including what I have just explained, which will tell you how the teacher will explain, uh, how, how the teacher will need to, you know, uh, uh, ready himself or herself, prepare himself or herself in order to make teaching as effective as possible. So let us go to the next slide. It will be small groups or large groups. Uh, in, in the small groups or large groups uh, um, strategy, students are broken into small groups where each group, I'm sorry about the spelling mistake right here, uh, where uh, each group is given a specific topic to learn, then they are then put in a large group where each small group gets a chance to share what they have learned. I remember teaching um, uh, the first year BH students about um, various theories of learning. And I divided the whole class into four, which is still large, but they're it could not be helped. If I made the uh, it, it any smaller, then the students would not have been able to cope at that point of time because many students had come from different disciplines. Very, very few had come from the discipline of education itself to continue with their BA. So I divided the whole 50 students into four groups and wow. I gave them each a topic. So uh, after the third day, the students from each uh, group selected their class representatives, they selected their group representatives, and the whole classroom came together where each group presented its work to the classroom. So the feedback I got from that was that they learned more about and they understood more about the theories of learning from what they themselves had learned instead of me going on and on and on about learning theories. So in small groups and large group strategies are very, very useful when it comes to strategies of teaching or learning also. So remember when we talk about teaching, learning also automatically comes into the picture because we are interested in teaching only because of the learners. So even if the strategy looks very good on theory, in theory, if it doesn't serve the learners, then we need to remember that it's not really very relevant for us. So we need to choose what is relevant for us. We need to choose what will be reliable. We need to choose what will be really useful in the real classroom setting. So breaking, uh, breaking students into small groups and then you know, bringing them together, it gives them a kind of confidence that students otherwise do not possess.
But of course, when we choose a topic for them, we need to be careful to choose topics that will not have very, very deep impacts, you know, that will not have very, very deep impacts because their preparation may not be enough. Their, you know, their understanding may not be deep enough. So in that way, the teacher also has to be careful in choosing the learning topics for the students. But what I have found from my own experience in making use of small groups and large group strategy is that the there is hardly anything that students are not willing to learn hardly anything that are beyond the students' abilities to prepare for. This is what I have experienced when it comes to small groups and large groups. So I will just go on, as I said, this is going to be teacher-centered. However, if in between you have any questions, there is a Q&A box, and you also can make use of the chat box to make use of uh, uh, whatever um, mm, uh, whatever uh, doubt you may have, all right? So uh, <clears throat> they, they, they get a chance to speak. You know, here again, I, I'm I have been, you know, uh, on the opposite end of online classes and I know how boring it can be. So uh, I understand that some of you are already, you know, in your very own second stage or third stages. So therefore, if you would like to have, you know, a further interaction, you can make use of the chat box or we can request the, uh, the uh, admin to, to, you know, uh, for a short while at least, uh, uh, release your voice and your video if you would like to be interactive so uh, that is also possible and that is also something we could do right then um, effective class discussions effective class discussions are done by you know lectures seminars peer-to-peer -peer dialogue. I remember when I was teaching very young students before I came to the university, starting uh, with a small peer-to-peer -peer dialogue. They were secondary school students and I was teaching them the basics of uh, simplification. So um, I was, I was, you know, I was still very young, but then I wanted the girls and the boys to compete with it with each other. And it at that time I had not even undergone um, my B Ed training, so I was largely unaware of peer to peer dialogue, so on and so forth. But then I found that that till today I remember those years because when I started that simple competition between the girls and the boys, they began to you know, participate even more effectively, even more actively, because, you know, the pride was involved at that point of time, boys against girls, and not in a bad way. So the girls also learned to work together. The boys also learned to work together in that the spirit of cooperation and also the spirit of competition was garnered, you know, uh, generated at one time. So I, I think I was, you know, sort of uh, killing two birds with one stone at that point of time. So lectures can also be made effective. Seminars can also be made effective. So these days, even at our master's class, when we have seminars, we often find the students participating less, the teachers and only the presenters participating, which is sad. I think it is time for all of us to again arouse the real spirit of seminars. Let When the teacher, you know, when the teacher in a very, very crafty way, in a very, very strategic way, tries to make it, tries to enable each and every learner to speak out when he is motivated, when he is encouraged, not intimidated, but encouraged in place of intimidation, then he or she, they, they, they begin to want to speak out on any subject it could be world hunger, it could be on world peace, it could be on the fundamentals of physics. So uh, no gender differentiation at all. The students simply want to speak up. So one thing that I feel can make an effective class discussion is the teacher's willingness to respect the students. The students may sometimes come up with very good 
you know, uh, very good discussions. And sometimes the discussions may also turn out to be rather uh, uh, poor and not just poor. Sometimes the discussions may also turn out to be um, uh, not to the point and uh, largely quite useless also. But the teacher's, um, uh, the teacher's objective at this point should not be to just, uh, you know, make sure that the students are coming up with the right point, but to make sure that all of the students are interested in what they are doing, what is being discussed in the class, and to make them feel that they are that part of discussion, that nobody is excluded in that group. All of them are a part of that group. And because they are a part of that group, everybody is important. So that is why I, I don't like, uh, you know, online classes so much because I cannot pay individual attention to my classes. And, you know, at this point of time, um, some of you may be doing something else entirely, and I don't know how much attention you are paying, but it is so important, all of these, because when we bring them to the classroom, they make sense of teaching. I remember when I was class, I think I was in class nine myself, there was a very, very good chemistry teacher. And we always said, she is so good. She knows so much, but she doesn't know how less we know, you know? She doesn't know how less we know. So since she knows so much, and since we don't know anything, uh, we, don't, we, we are not at her level. So therefore we don't understand what she is teaching. It's not that she is bad. We did not complain. It was not that she was bad. She was a university topper. But then the way she taught was in such a way that, you know, maybe master students would have appreciated. But for secondary school students, the basic things that she took for granted uh, were things that, you know, we were not even acquainted with. The words that she used were things, the words that made absolutely no sense to us as secondary school students. So therefore her knowledge, her abilities, her intelligence, everything was almost totally wasted on us. So in order to make these classroom discussions effective, teacher has to respect, has to understand the students. What, how much do my students understand? How much will they be able to grasp at a point of time? All of these are important to make the classroom effective, to, cl to make the classroom teaching effective. Again, this is case-based. Uh, students apply their knowledge to real world scenarios, promoting higher levels of cognition. Now, case-based study can be really slow. Why is it slow? slow? Uh, they can be slow because we are largely dependent on our students to, you know, draw up a case, find the uh, problem in that particular case, try to come up with um, a solution for that case, you know, and move forward. So it uh, especially if we are, you know, working towards a certain target. 30th November is when we have to complete the course. 17th November is when we have to complete the course. 22nd November is when we have to complete the course. If we have targets, specific targets like that, case-based learning strat strategies or teaching strategies can be really um, uh, time consuming. Uh, because the students need to apply their knowledge to the real world scenarios. But if once they can do this, it can help them in their whole lifetime. Uh, I will just give an example again at this point. Uh, students who really can appreciate the importance of mensuration Remember mensuration. In mensuration, we learned about the areas, uh, areas of uh, you know different shapes, trapeziums, circles, rectangles, so on and so forth. So, if a person wants to become a carpenter, and if he wants to make use of the mensuration, his abilities as a carpenter will be vastly, hugely increased. You know, applying their knowledge to the real world scenarios. So when the teacher makes a particular case um, and applies it, uh, makes a particular case applicable in the real world situation and enables the students to be more uh, 
to be more and more acquainted with that, then uh, you know the situation can become hugely elevated. But you know the downside of case-based studies is that they can be time-consuming. As I said, not all students learn at the same pace, and since it is not teacher-centered. The teacher has to wait for each and every class to be ready for the next step. So therefore, the case-based uh, studies are good at higher levels, uh, obviously at your level, because you're teaching in colleges and universities. So it will be useful at your level, but at the lower levels, it will not be so useful. But if we will look into the national uh, you, you know, the National Education Policy 2020, you will find that even this NEP 2020 has, you know, been leaning very, very heavily on this case-based education, starting from the middle school onwards, because they are largely project-based. Project-based teaching strategy is also case-based strategy. The, nom the nomenclature may be slightly different, but the meaning of these two, they are quite the same, case-based or project-based. Then again, digital learning. So I think all of us, we know what digital learning is today. Um, interactive remote teaching using digital resources. Right now also, this is digital learning in practice, isn't it? You all know the benefits of that. It is less expensive because I am teaching from my university and you all are sitting in your own universities or college campuses or maybe even at home and you were attending classes. So in that way, you know, money for tickets is saved, time is saved, you know, and there are so many other ways in which we can spend the energy while we still have the acquisition of the required uh, faculty induction program training certificate. So digital learning is uh, something that became more popular with the COVID, isn't it? It became more popularized with COVID because we could hardly depend on anything. So that in itself is a testament of the effectiveness of digital learning. Even when our movements were encumbered by a heavy, uh, you know, a fatal pandemic, yet we were able to learn through the use of digital resources we used the Google, we used Zoom, we used email, and in many cases also we used, uh, 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 you know, uh, social media like WhatsApp or even um, Instagram. In many cases, teachers have been known to use uh, Instagram and also um, what uh, F Facebook. I think I have said Facebook, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp. These are the three main social media that have become rather useful when it comes to digital learning. Of course, uh, when it, uh, within the confines of digital learning, nothing can replace the kind of interaction that we can have through Zoom or through um, uh, uh, through the Google Meets, because here we are interacting, making use of real time, making use of your time and my time in a good way. Not me doing something, sending it to you through WhatsApp or your email or your Facebook message and you viewing it at your own convenience. It doesn't happen that way. We learn and teach at the same time. The, the, the interaction is active. And if you have any difficulty at any point of time, you can always come up and use the chat box. Just like that, you can also make use of the uh, 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 you can also make use of the, um, what we call it, um, the, uh, um, what is that? Um, um, the words that I want are not coming to me. <laughs> so, um, you, you, you can also make use of whatever you have learned today and store it up for later use. You can store it up for later use or you may also use it immediately depending on your style of learning, depending on the kind of time you learn best. You can adjust yourself, isn't it? But in, in this, when teaching goes, uh, when teaching 
when digital learning takes place through the Zoom and through the Google, everything is active. And even if they are recorded, to be able to listen live is still much better, isn't it? So, so uh, let us move forward. Team-based learning. Uh, I wonder if there is any one of us who do not know about team-based learning. Now, this is a pedagogical uh, uh, strategy, again, that engages students' knowledge through individual testing and group collaboration. Following individual answers, the, the students join the teams and work through their problems. So this is one way of going through a team-based learning. Then there is another way of uh, doing team-based learning. I wonder if you have heard of it, but or if you have seen it, or if you have taken a part in a team-based learning. In team-based learning, uh, which is a very, very good, relevant strategy, two teachers from different disciplines can come together and they can make studies more lively, the teaching more lively so that students will be able to appreciate what is being taught in a more relevant and a deeper manner. For example, me being an educationist teaching in the discipline, uh, me being in the discipline, the discipline of education can team up with somebody from psychology or somebody from sciences. And, you know, there are so many areas in which these two things are, you know, both needed an element of science and an element of education, an element of psychology and an element of education, when these two come, they can enable the students to question the teachers on many aspects that, you know, the students from, um, the teacher from science may not know uh, all things regarding a certain concept. And same way, the teacher from education may not know all things about a certain subject, but when they combine their forces, what they learn, what they understand about that subject based on their own point of view can enrich the lecture so much. So in one classroom, uh, you know, uh, when we do team-based learning, you can also have three teachers, four or five teachers. But in my experience, a maximum of two teachers. All right. In my experience, a maximum of two teachers is always best. A maximum of two teachers is always best because when there are three teachers or more, in a team-based learning, they tend, the teachers tend to overcrowd each other, you know, they tend to overcrowd each other, they tend to, you know, disturb, I don't know if that is the right word to use, they tend to disturb each other's space, and so uh, the students sometimes end up being confused, and when the students are confused, then they don't really learn anything. Uh, not only do they not learn anything, but what is very, very uh, sad for, you know, the students themselves and the teacher themselves also is that um, the students are not getting what the teachers have prepared themselves for and the teachers are uh, are not accomplishing their task and they don't, do not even get the proper feedback that they deserve. So therefore, when it comes to team-based learning as a strategy, it is very, very important to be well prepared to see that the students are able to understand what is being explained by each teacher. For example, uh, I'm, I want to talk about extinction and the impact of extinction in my everyday life. Since I am not from science, I need somebody from science to explain uh, about extinction and how it is happening and why maybe it is a necessity in the cycle of life, in the cycle of evolution, why extinction may also be a necessity in that. So for all of that, I need an expert in uh, sciences, especially life sciences, to tell my students about the concept of extinction. And in order to enable my students to understand their part in their everyday life, how to make, you know, how to, 
make use of environmental resources in a wise way, how to make use of environmental resources uh, in, in the most impactful way, in the, uh, you know, in um, how to, uh, um, how to make use of this uh, environmental resources in the most sustainable way. Sustainable is the word I'm looking for. So in the most sustainable way, my learning as an education, my background as an education becomes important. So the two knowledges, they merge. The zoologist talks about extinction, the speed of extinction, what factors affect extinction, then the teacher uh, that teaches education learns about, teaches about how that education affects the person directly. It's not about a very, very abstract uh, concept. Extinction is something that affects me daily. So how does it affect me? And listen, until I know and learn and appreciate how a certain phenomenon affects me directly, it's very, very difficult to appreciate the importance of any concept, especially scientific concepts. So therefore, team-based learning, uh, you know, gains more effectiveness when the audience, when uh, the students are not being exposed to too many teachers teaming up with each other. As I said, let there be two. And if there really, really is a need, three teachers to team up, to break up a learning, uh, uh, um, a general learning uh, topic into you know different subtopics based on their expertise area and then uh, to teach the class without overcrowding the class because a huge danger comes from uh, overcrowding the class. If overcrowding happens, then uh, the sad part is that the teachers can prepare themselves so well. They might have spent nights and days to have that particular lecture ready, but the students will not be able to appreciate. It will simply be a waste of time for both the teachers and also for the students. So the team-based learning can be a strategy and it can also be a hindrance to teaching. If the teachers really know how to make use of, you know, teachers, uh, teachers are very, very dominant. That also I think we need to realize. And it is very difficult for one teacher to give wave to another teacher. So if teachers are teaming up and both teachers are constantly you know striving to take maximum attention of the students so there is an unknown or sometimes even observable uh, competition between the two teachers which are supposedly teams so they tend to you know uh, take away the teaching take away the uh, learning objectives rather than uh, be more impactful uh, for their specific learning objectives, which is why I'm saying when we do a team-based teaching, and uh, I repeat, they can be very, very effective, but when we do a team-based teaching or learning without understanding the ethos that are involved, without understanding the, you know, uh, the, the, uh, mental exercise that are involved besides, you know, mere teaching. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to put down teaching by saying mere teaching, but I think you all can appreciate what I'm trying to say. Instead of one teacher teaching in a team teaching uh, situation, the teachers from different disciplines and different learning experiences come together to make the most of uh, one hour or two hours so that students can benefit in the maximum way. So that is team-based learning. And in that also, uh, another thing, as I said, is when students divide themselves into teams, they also begin to learn. 
as I said, small groups and large groups are also largely based on team-based learning. So when students divide themselves into group, they become more competitive and they also learn to collaborate within their small groups. They learn to make use of you know, each other's abilities. I remember in the previous refresher course, breaking up the class into small, about 20, groups, then uh, uh, out of five people in a group, one would be good in making you know, a computer presentation. The other would be good in the gathering information. The other would be good in editing. So people with different fields of expertise came together and they all gave beautiful presentations. So all of these can be very, very useful team-based, uh, very, very useful strategies when it comes to teaching. Remember, as we said, uh, there is no such thing as the best strategy. Even the most criticized lecture method is something that till today, even the 21st century, we cannot escape from. There are so many... <clears throat> There are so many different kinds of teaching strategies that have come up, but we still cannot do away with the lecture method, with the simple lecture method, with the teacher-centered method. So therefore, there really is no teaching strategy which is inferior or which is so superior. Each teaching strategy can be superior based on the concepts that is taught and also based on the audience, based on the students who are being taught. So therefore, you should not, when you, when you come across some beautiful strategy that somebody has you know, made a success of, it doesn't mean that it will be immediately successful in your own classroom, nor does it mean that you will be able to have you know, uh, a complete success yourself in any classroom using that strategy. So therefore, when you make use of team-based learning, when you make use of team-based teaching, remember, that it is very, very important to be attentive. If you are breaking the students into teams, you need to know your students. For example, all the intelligent ones can be in one group, leaving out the other groups. Or maybe, you know, all girls will be in one group, leaving out the other groups. All the boys can be in one group, leaving the other groups. So therefore, it is important to see that, uh, you know, there is heterogeneity in each group and that all the groups will be homogeneous so that competition will be, you know, even. Competition will not be too stiff for one group, that it will be even. So this is what we call the team-based learning. Uh, I, I, as I said earlier, I have been going on and on. If in between you have any kind of questions, if there are any, any part uh, with which you feel you need some extra guidance, uh, more explanation, I'm ready to do that. Then I'm going ahead. So the flipped classroom, you know, I just completed one short course on the flipped classroom. I just completed the coordination of a flipped classroom. So here I'm trying to explain the concept of a flipped classroom in a few lines. So you can only understand how little I have been able to, you know, put in this lecture. In a flipped classroom, materials typically explored in a lecture is delivered outside of class through media like video lectures or digital modules. Class timing then focuses on developing knowledge through active learning strategies like discussion or group activities. Flipping the classroom has been known to improve students' conceptual grasp of content beyond memorization and basic knowledge and to improve the diversity and inclusivity of the classroom climate. When we talk about flipping, I think you all know when you flip a coin, you simply put it up, isn't it? So flipping, I don't have anything to flip on my table, right? at this point of time, but I think you all know what flip is. So we turn it upside down, isn't it? Sometimes, uh, for example, the, this is my mask, 
this is my mask on the uh, on the front you, we have uh, the brand name the brand name if i flip it it is like this isn't it this is my mask when i flip it the brand name is also reversed on the front side it was on this side now when i flip it it is on the reverse isn't it it has been reversed a very very simple thing so like that in a flipped classroom what the teacher now one thing that i want you to be very very careful is that when we do a flipped classroom especially at master's level then students um, sometimes students are overburdened because the teacher does not know how much content is to be included in a particular flipped classroom. What we need to understand is that the flipped classroom, just like the flipping, you know, reversing, upside down, backside front. So when we reverse, when we flip, when we flip, flipping, flipping, uh, the relationship of teacher and taught flip the teacher teaches and then questions the students the question the students answer and from then we move on but in the flips classroom what happens is that the students comes isn't it the students come it's flipped it's flipped upside down so the students come with the learning contents the teacher may question or sometimes the teacher may you know put something more and then they learn together so the concept of the flipped classroom is you know uh, the teacher first of all makes an exploration of what is to be taught and he gives or she gives maximum chance for the students to learn whatever is to be learned regarding a certain course and in the next class or maybe in a week, the students are expected to, you know, present what they have learned based on what the teacher has given them before. So it is largely based on the uh, concept of exchange of duties, rather, exchange of duties. Exchange of duties, I don't know if that actually explains flipped classroom, exchange of duties it may not be so very apt because the duties remain the same. Uh, it could be a, a taking of turns. Instead of the teacher explaining first, the students learn, then they try to explain what is being taught uh, by whatever material has been provided. And based on that, both the teacher and also the students, they start to learn. I think it is very, very clear. I don't know whether any one of you has, you know, been a part of the flipped classroom, but I strongly encourage a flipped classroom. I remember there, I have introduced a flipped classroom only once, and that was in a minor discipline paper um, for human rights education. I introduced a flipped classroom wherein I had prepared a short PowerPoint for the students uh, to learn at home. Then uh, in the next class, which was after about seven days, the students were expected to come and to share with me what they have learned from the topic based on the material that I had given and also based on whatever material they have been able to gather themselves, not straying from the topic, remaining within the topic. So keeping that in mind, I well, did a small um, experiment of a flipped classroom and I found it to be rather useful. I found it to be rather useful in that the students no longer were, you know, just sitting and listening or, you know, dreaming while I was explaining to them about certain concepts regarding human rights. They were really interested, you know, they were in groups and they were afraid that the first group would speak about the second group was afraid that the first group would speak about points that they had prepared themselves on. So since I had given them one, you know, one uniform material to learn on, the students were really competing with each other. They really knew what was contained in that topic. Uh, in other words, they became more involved with the teaching 
uh, experience. And in it all, I think, at least I felt, although they did not say much, uh, I think uh, I felt they benefited much more from that simple teaching strategy than they would have benefited from a you know, an ordinary lecture, because the concepts that we learned in that flips classroom were things that could have been easily, you know, explained in the classroom. But when they learned it themselves, when they presented it themselves, some of them using their own slides, some of them using the slides that I had provided. So when they started taking responsibility for what they were learning, they became uh, more, um, I think the word I used was involved. And I think involved is right. They became much more involved in what they were learning. And as they became more involved in what they were learning, they also became, um, uh, you know, uh, not just much more knowledgeable, that knowledge part is automatically there. They became even more affected, you know, affected is the word, even more affected by the human rights education. So, uh, when they had enough time to pour on a subject, they were not just learning about the concepts in a very, very abstract way. They began to, excuse me, they began to appreciate just how much the topic was related to them, just how closely it was related to them. So on that note, they began to prepare themselves. They began to uh, uh, learn themselves, they began to, you know, uh, uh, they began to form an association with human rights. So in, uh, 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 from, uh, although, as I said earlier, I had only introduced it once because I was afraid the students would not be able to grasp it, one thing, and the other was that I was also afraid I would not be able to, as I said, teachers are target bound. So I was also afraid I would not be able to accomplish my work on time. So therefore, I simply did not, um, I simply did not spend more than one topic uh, to make use of the flipped classroom. So, but when I did that, what I realized was the students were able to totally, totally understand, not just understand, but in future as well. As I went further into the different topics of human rights, the students began to appreciate the concept of human rights. Uh, just what is meant by educational rights? What is meant by, you know, uh, women's rights? What, 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 how does it affect them? So many rights and responsibilities in the constitution that they had not, you know, that they had not really appreciated them before. After we had the flipped classroom, I realized that the students were very much, you know, more acquainted with human rights education and they were, you know, bolder. They were bolder, they were courageous enough now to come up with, you know, sometimes to agree with me and then sometimes to not agree with me also. So we spoke about, you know, something very much outside the, outside the syllabus was tribal rights. We spoke about tribal rights, the rights of the indigenous people, so on and so forth. So uh, from a simple flipped classroom experiment, even in those other classrooms where, uh, you know, the flipped classroom was not introduced, the students began to be much more confident than they had been earlier. So when you uh, when you go back to your classroom, I strongly uh, I strongly encourage you to use the flipped classroom. I am sure whatever discipline you have come from, your students will be make, able to make use of it. But do remember that when you make use of the flipped classroom, you have to be wise in choosing your topic. It has to be a topic that the students will, you know, the average student will um, have to fight a little bit for, but not too hard. That is what you have to remember regarding the 
flipped classroom, something that the students will have to fight for, but not too hard, not too hard that they lose their courage or whatever. Now, teal. Uh, teal is, uh, um, has anyone ever heard of teal? Uh, uh, if you have heard of teal, you can, you know, type it in the chat box. Okay, um, uh, teal is, uh, Teal is a simple concept. It's uh, uh, technology enhanced, all right? It's uh, technology enhanced uh, learning, uh, alternative learning also. So here the classes are equipped. Uh, these uh, these teal classrooms are have now become rather common in the developed countries. The, the classes are equipped with round tables for small group work, multiple projector screens are there, whiteboards and a podium, you know, the lectern. Uh, with the ability to project all around the rooms. If you, like, for example, you're studying astronomy, then everything that you want is in that classroom. One, one whiteboard to, uh, you know, for active, uh, for active writing of the teacher and also the students if the need arises. And then also uh, those multiple projectors will be showing different sides of, for example, you want to study about arts. So um, you want to study about earth. Let's say you want to study about Earth, its size, you know, the features of Earth, so on and so forth. So in that teal classroom, the simple thing that you do is one side of the projector will uh, will throw light on one side of the Earth. Another projector will throw light on another side of the Earth, and another projector will, you know, might actively show Earth revolving, you know, and also rotating, rotating and revolving at the same time like this so in that way the students at all levels masters phd undergraduate uh, secondary classes they all learn uh, you know the very very intricate part of earth and its movement in one classroom without having to move outside and sometimes active video conferencings are also enabled by the teachers and some botanists or zoologists so that students can actively interact with them the video is there you know the teacher's podium is there for the teachers to speak but as i said earlier teals are useful only so far as uh, 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 you know the economy is good because uh, it involves a lot of the use of technology so uh, that is why um, it, Geo classrooms are good. It's wise to make use of them also. But at the same time, what needs to be remembered is that um, in, uh, you know, in a country like India, where we try to economize with every little step, then sometimes these uh, teal classrooms cannot accomplish so much. Um, yeah, and uh, the other thing is that one big state may be able to have a teal classroom and the other states may not be able to have that. So that situation is also there. This is what we have to remember regarding the teal classrooms, but they can be most effective because the teacher, the real teacher is there, the internet is there, different parts of anything can be viewed at different angles. So the students are, you know, given not an overload, I should say, not exactly an overload, but the students are given a very rich background of what they, whatever they are learning. So, uh, it, so, so there is active interactions and also, uh, each and every part of the classroom is made use of for active writing, for viewing, you know, and as I said earlier, active video conferencing, conferencing, so on and so forth. So teal classrooms have been made use uh, largely by American universities and schools. So let us hope maybe in India also in the near future, as the country is planning to make more than 50% uh, uh, admissions, isn't it? Um, at different levels uh, till 2040, the aim is till 2040 for the NEP 2020. Let us see how much is being accomplished by our uh, Ministry of Education. So because the hope is that 6% of the GDP will be put, 6% will be really put into education. Today, we hardly use, you know, 
uh, three point something percent of the GDP. But if we have been able to look at our big universities with the beautiful buildings and the teachers and the students that have been accommodated in different parts of the universities, you will understand that a lot has been accomplished by a small percentage of the nation's GDP. So if by chance, if you know the, the nation can give six percent of its GDP to education, you can only imagine maybe we will be able to have tier classrooms in all of our universities. That would be just so beautiful, isn't it? So uh, anyway, whatever the case may be, uh, one thing that I would like to uh, speak about always is effective learning. Uh, remember, <clears throat> effective teaching, effective learning. Remember, when I opened this lecture, I said this is going to be largely teacher centered because I can hardly resort to anything. I cannot see your faces. I don't know what you are doing. I am largely depending. I am largely dependent on you. So it is, you know, ultimately based on trust between you and me which is also really beautiful. You have not seen my face ever, and I have not seen your face ever. So uh, how do we carry on uh, uh, teaching? I said it would be largely uh, teacher-centered, centered on me, because there is no other way in which we can make use of this unless and until I open all the videos and all the you know uh, microphones, uh, this is the only way we can do it because once I open the floodgates, then each one of you, you know, you may want to speak up and then you will be dominating the screen and no real studying will be carried out. That is why we have resorted to a very, very teacher centered uh, uh, teaching strategy, which is not at all advised in this day and age, but which we have to resort to now and again in order to be more effective. So uh, how, what is meant by effective teaching? <clears throat> Lecture classes are often characterized by monologue and slide presentations, as I said. <clears throat> uh, Uh, this is, I, I will just answer your, uh, I will answer your question uh, at the end of this, and it is almost done anyway. So just let me complete this. I will give time to you and your friends also. So uh, lecture classes are often characterized by monologue and slide presentations, typically in large halls with auditorium style fixed seating that privileges uh, <clears throat> content delivery over interactions and complex learning. Yet. Research shows that even small tweaks to lecture like pauses, time for questions, and small group discussions can promote higher level learning and refresh students' attention span. I remember when I was a young child reading about the average attention span of a normal human being. Does anyone know the uh, uh, normal attention, uh, the attention span of a normal human being, a normal adult? So uh, in that in that particular article, I had I had read that the normal attention span of an adult is twenty minutes. But you will notice that even starting from kindergarten onwards, the normal classes are never less than forty minutes. So from the starting point, we seem to have gone against the, <laughs> the, 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 the rule of nature, isn't it? But anyway, uh, we have four, uh, 24 hours and the human mind's ability to adapt is so great. Now, what, what do we mean by effective teaching strategy? Effective teaching is a part of lecture. 
In many cases, as I said, the teal is something that makes use of the teacher's ability, the ability of the internet, the projector's ability, the video conferencing ability, so many resources, most of them technology, enhancing the teacher's lecture in the classroom. So uh, you can only, even without seeing, even without experiencing, you can only imagine how rich and how profitable it is going to be for the students to partake of that kind of classroom. But what we need to understand is that many of those things can also be too dependent on technology. And when we become too dependent on technology, often the danger rises in the fact that the human resource, they tend to prepare themselves less and less. And when the human preparation becomes less and less, when it declines, all right, when it declines, then the day is going to come when that technology will not be able to feed the minds of the students because everything, the origin of those technology, everything starts with the human minds. Today, I have prepared a lecture of one and a half hours on teaching strategy. If I depend on this for the whole of, uh, you know, for the whole of uh, my career, there are going to be many new strategies coming up each year, each month, but I'm still depending on this material that I prepared in 2022, then I'm not going to be an effective teacher. So how do I become an effective teacher? To become an effective teacher, you know, in your lecture, you may not have all the, you know, modern resources that we have been talking about, like the projector, like the smart board, like the internet in the classroom, like video conferencing abilities, but you have you. And there are so many things that you can use of in the classroom. And one thing we are going to speak about effective teacher is micro teaching skills. I will speak to you about effective teaching, making use of micro teaching. Here, I'm hoping you will be very, very interactive, as interactive as possible. All right. So uh, I will just, um, before I address this, I would just like to go into another uh, how to make your strategies effective. Uh, you can learn so many kinds of teaching strategies. You can have team teaching, you can have lectures, you can have seminars, you can have debates, you can have discussions, you can have deal, you can have remote teaching, you can have digital teaching, you can have so many different kinds of strategies for learning. But unless and until you uh, know how to make them effective, they will not be so effective. Number one, to make your strategies effective is you need to know your students and their level of understanding. How much do they understand? How much have they learned? How much will they be able to grasp within a given time? And you also need to be aware of your students' psychology. What things do they like? What things do they not like? Remember, I was teaching about environmental education. I had, you know, written long, long notes in that PowerPoint. It did not get through the students. But that simple picture of the polar bear being trapped in a broken ice, it touched their hearts. And the, the two of my students, they were so touched that even when they completed their masters, they wanted to continue with their PhDs based on environmental studies and environmental education itself. So being aware of student psychology, I'm not saying I was aware of the student psychology at that point of time, I was just lucky, but it can, it can, it can go, you know, knowing about the students psychology can go a long way in you know, connecting what is being taught to the student's understanding. Because once what is being taught and his understandings are, you know, permanently locked, he will never forget. And what he has learned will be a ladder, will be a step in the ladder to climb to the next step in his ladder. The willingness to apply new knowledge in the area of teaching. I, you know, there are, I, I remember when I did my research, 
uh, a new a new computer application called SPSS had come up, but my my supervisor was not willing to make me use of that because he felt that it was sort of um, um, uh, it, it was a sort of like you know the degeneration of the human brain that it would just corrupt human knowledge. So he did not want me to make use of that. But then later on, he came to realize that making use of that would also save time if uh, a scholar understood the concept. Making use of that particular uh, computer application would save time for him and the scholar. So he was willing to apply new knowledge. I understand that now he is actively making use of that computer knowledge. The teacher's willingness to trust in new things, you know, the blackboard is replaced by the green board. The green board in many cases is now replaced by the white board. The white board is now being replaced by the smart board. Maybe not to neglect all the things that have been in use before, but to complement them with the things that had been used before, the willingness to apply new knowledge in the area of teaching. So another thing is like you have come today, many of you are refreshing yourselves, I can sense. And then many of you have come for your first time, uh, uh, first time um, uh, induction program. But I know that many of you have, you know, attended these uh, sorts of programs before. The willingness to refresh that is beautiful. I will just tell you, because it is only through my own, you know, understanding of concepts, it is only through my, um, you know, real experience that uh, I can make you understand certain things I feel. Uh, back in the year 2004, I attended a refresher course in Jadavpur University. The topic for that particular uh, uh, refresher course was on dance. I don't know how to dance. I don't even, you know, understand the concept of dancing. And i am it's not a topic that I teach in my class at all. But the whole experience of interacting with different minds from different parts of the country, you know, uh, coming as teachers, and then my own batchmates, they are the ones on whom I have called till today, you know, almost 20 years later, whenever I need something from Kolkata or whenever I need something from other parts of the country, whenever I need a resource person, the, my old classmates are the ones I go back to. So in that way, it can be very, very useful. Now, uh, Dr. Siddiqui Ahmed Laskar, to attend to your question, let me first read. To go through all these teaching strategies, we need time. But Madam, in our syllabus, contact hours, number of lectures are also mentioned. Also, we have to take two unit tests in six months semester. Again, all the students are not in the same range in terms of merit. Madam, which method of teaching will give better results? As I said, there is no method of teaching which is, you know, superlative or which is uh, less useful. There is no, you know, there is no subordinate, there is no superior in all of these strategies, especially if you look at teaching strategies like TEAL. They look, the classrooms look very, very sophisticated. I wish I had been able to capture it, you know, TEAL classroom for you. You can look it up in the uh, internet if you want to. They look very, very sophisticated with all, with all of those multiple, you know, multiple projectors in one classroom, you know, smart boards, et cetera, et cetera. But what you need to remember is that uh, unless and until you know your students, and it may also be a distraction for the wrong kind of students, so many projectors in one classroom may also be a distraction. And as you said, in the real universities and in the real classrooms, we all are dependent, we all are, we all are target, the, you know, <clears throat> we all are targeted towards an end. We all have a specific target. So in that case, what I would advise strongly as a teacher is try to know your class in the first or the second class, try to know your class very well. And when I say try to know your class very well is that you may have to sacrifice 
one or two of your classes in actively interacting with your students instead of concentrating on the syllabus, although completion of the syllabus is uh, very, very important as we all know, but teachers, we all can adapt ourselves and what we have lost in one or two classes, we can make up in the other classes. For example, as I said uh, earlier, when I gave that, when I gave that simple small group, large group strategy for my first year BH students, I was, you know, I just uh, gave one classroom to introduce them to the topic of teaching theories. Then there are several teaching theories, which I divided into four, four kinds of teaching theories I gave to each group. And then in the next class, all of those groups could come spend 15 minutes each because I, I stipulated that no group could spend more than 15 minutes each. So see, I, I spent one class to introduce a topic and the second class was literally used to explain four teaching learning theories. So in that way, if you know your students, if you know their abilities, it's not that all of these teaching strategies should be used by all of us teachers. What particular teaching strategy would be used, would be useful, would be relevant for me? For example, the case study method. The case study strategy may not be so effective, I said very clearly, because it is not, uh, it, it does not respect time. The students learn at different levels. So the learning abilities are different. Their, the ways they want to learn are also different, right? Learning strategies are there, just like teaching strategies are there. So therefore, my advice and also to answer your question is that don't try to incorporate all of these teaching strategies in one classroom, try to incorporate one or two, which might be good for you. And you might not be able to make use of all these strategies, but you might need to depend only on the lecture method, which is the oldest method. Even if you are going to apply on the uh, this lecture method, make it so that different elements can be introduced in the lecture method. Try to make the students ready to learn. Try to know your students. Knowing the students is very, very important. Is there any other question? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, Professor Linda, uh, I think yes, there is sir. no more question. Only one question was there. You already answered yes, it. Yes. And. Uh, in the session, you shared your experience of flipped classroom. That was really very good. Thank and you, we sir. need to practice it, uh, but actually we need to learn it. Yes, how, that how is true. Because flipping classroom, uh, it's very easy to say, but uh, very difficult. Difficult, to yes, yes. As okay. I said, uh, as I said, sir, when we talk about the flipped classroom, the teacher needs to be the, the teacher needs to work harder than in a normal classroom because first of all, the teacher needs to know the students and their abilities. And when the, you know, the things to be learned first by the students are given by the teacher, he or she has to know what sort of topic has to be given in such a way that in a short span of time, the students would gain the required confidence to present those learning materials in the class themselves and discuss it with their students with their fellow students yes yes it, it needs more uh, more preparation than uh, yes, a deeper preparation uh, on but uh, once uh, successfully we implement it actually it will give very good result yes and, because uh, the students cannot help but be active they have to be active they need to be active because unless and until a particular section is completed they cannot go forward uh, yeah yes so let's uh, wound up this session here itself and uh, then we'll start the second session. Uh, want to um, take, uh, shall we 